Good day, everyone. Welcome to Lubrication Experts. My name is Rafe, and today we have Andy Wainick with us. Now, this is really exciting because Andy is, let's say, very well known within the grease industry for um, a number of, let's call them seminal papers. You know, I've heard them talked about, and I had heard about Andy long before I'd actually had the opportunity to meet him. So um, this is kind of like uh, meeting a celebrity of the grease world, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, Andy has done some amazing work over you know a number of decades and has many patents to his name some of you will know him from like a quite famous nlgi paper that was published a couple of years ago which has spread far and wide the uh, moody blues paper i always find that interesting because that's based i guess on on an album days of the future past which if you say that to someone roughly of my age that kind of takes on a different meaning rather than a music album i think of the chris claremont uh, X-Men run in the 1980s. That's a whole different thing. So first of all, Andy, uh, thank you so much for for joining us and giving us the time. Well, you're quite welcome, Ray. It's a pleasure to be here. And by the way, uh, I also know about that X-Men movie. I have it on Blu-ray. <laughs> Excellent. Good, good, good to hear. So today, what we're talking about is um, an area of greases, which I think in some ways are underappreciated, but let's call it in the zeitgeist, right? So especially with some of the recent increases in the raw price of lithium, for example, um, you know, calcium sulfonates are coming into the conversation a little bit more where in the past, maybe the price point uh, made them, uh, you know, push them out of some conversations when it came to some customers. Now, all of a sudden, this is really being talked about as a really strong candidate to be an alternate to some of our regular greases but in a lot more scenarios. So that's why I really wanted to touch on it today. And there's no one better to talk about the subject than, than Andy. So Andy, if you wouldn't mind, could we please just start with kind of a brief overview um, of the manufacturing process um, for, for calcium sulfonates? That'd be, that'd be really good. That'd be great, Rafe. And uh, quote Julie Andrews, let's start at the very beginning. That's a very good place to start. Um, to do that, I actually want to go back and talk a little bit about the raw material that's used to make these calcium sulfonate greases, namely the highly overbased, nominally 400 total base number, calcium alkyl benzene sulfonates. Um, and you're right, I did do a review paper on that a few years ago, the so-called Moody Blues paper. And the story of the development of these greases, of these uh, sulfonates, is key to understanding how the overbased sulfonate greases are made. That story began actually in 1942 with three patents. Internal combustion engines were becoming more severe and they were putting more stringent demands on the crankcase oils. Valve sticking and varnish buildup was becoming a problem. And these three patents in 1942 talked about the use of barium, alkyl benzene sulfonate salts as detergents to help mitigate the valve sticking and varnish buildup. And what was really important in these patents were that although they provided limited experimental data, they claimed that it was possible to make barium sulfonates with more barium in it than what you'd normally require to neutralize the sulfonic acids. In other words, you had about twice as much barium Later patents identified that barium in the form of what appeared to be barium hydroxide, but the stuff was still clear and bright and Newtonian. That extra barium couldn't be seen, but it was apparently there. And the more barium you could put in in excess, the better it was as a detergent. Well, seeing that, the race was on. And over the next 20 years, the ability to cram more barium at first and then ultimately more calcium progressed. It, initially, it was found barium was easier to overbase than calcium. But as the chemistry and the techniques were developed over the next 20 years, eventually calcium displaced barium. Now, with today's perspective, you might think, well, they switched to calcium because of the toxicity reputation of barium. That wasn't true. Back then, that toxicity reputation didn't exist. The main driver was cost. Calcium was a much cheaper barium so, uh, so base source than barium. 
So there was a cost incentive to figure out how to make calcium work better, and they did. By the early 1960s, they were able to make 400 TBN overbased calcium sulfonates. That had about 20 times or more calcium in it than what was required to neutralize the sulfonic acids. To give you an idea of what that means, that would mean that, and, and it's still true today, a 400 TBN overbased calcium sulfonate has a nominally 32% by weight of extra calcium, primarily in the form of calcium carbonate, or at least it has the composition of calcium carbonate. Let me show you what that looks like. I borrowed some materials from my wife's pantry. This is actually olive oil, but adjusting for density, this represents the volume of 100 grams of an overbased calcium sulfonate today, a 400 TBN calcium sulfonate. Now, the calcium sulfonate would be a more dark, dark material, a more amber brown, but it would be clear, it would be bright, and it would be Newtonian just like this. How much calcium carbonate is actually hidden in here? This much. When you consider that, ask how much, where is this white calcium carbonate in that? That gives you an idea of the amazing technology that developed over approximately 20 years. The other amazing thing, and this didn't happen until a little bit later, but it was determined that this calcium carbonate is not in a crystalline form that can be determined at least by X-ray diffraction. Hence the term amorphous calcium carbonate. Morphe is Greek for form or substance. And of course, if you put an alpha in front of a Greek word, it negates it, meaning no. The corresponding English alphabet letter for alpha is A. So amorphous means no form. I'll talk a little bit more about why that's misleading in a minute. But with that, we're ready to talk about calcium sulfonate greases. One of the later pioneers in developing overbased calcium sulfonate, especially in the early 60s, was a Lubrizol scientist named Richard L. McMillan. And I have this story direct from a friend of mine at Lubrizol who swears it's true, and I believe that it's true. Uh, in the early 1960s, Richard McMillan was developing and doing work to do a laboratory batch of one of his new highly overbased 400 TBN calcium sulfonates. It was lunchtime, so he broke for lunch. When he came back from lunch, apparently something had gone amiss. And instead of stirring a clear, bright Newtonian solution of a highly overbased calcium alkyl benzene sulfonate, his reaction vessel was stirring a thick batch of grease. Now, he should have known this was a problem, and he probably did, because a, a number of patents about 10 years earlier warned that if you didn't do the overbasing chemistry very carefully, you could end up with something that the patents referred to as a highly exotropic mixture. That's just code for a grease-like material. However, up until McMillan's awry experiment, everybody thought this was a, something to be avoided at all costs. McMillan was the first person to think lemons, lemonade. And as a result, from around 1965 to 1966 to 1970, he filed for and received five U.S. patents covering the manufacturing of what is now considered the first calcium sulfonate-based greases. Everything that we have now on calcium sulfonate-based greases is based on McMillan's work. What also happened, as I mentioned earlier, was in this latter work that McMillan did in his two 1970 patents, his work showed for the first time that the calcium carbonate in the overbased calcium sulfonate did not diffract x-rays. You couldn't get the crystal structure of calcite. That's why it was referred to as amorphous calcium carbonate, as I've mentioned. So that is, that is really the story of the initial overbased calcium sulfonates. Now, with regard to the structure, 
Truthfully, we're not entirely sure what the exact structure of the overbased calcium sulfonate is. You'll see drawings of it, and it will typically have a spherical core, which we do know exists. And presumably inside that core resides all the excess calcium carbonate in the amorphous form calcium cations, carbonate anions, and some hydroxide anions, because usually you need some of that as well to make a stable structure, usually. And then around the sphere pointing outward is neutral calcium alkylbenzene sulfonate in what's called a reverse micelle structure. We know that's the structure, but what we don't know is what's going on in that core. Pictures usually will show a random shotgun hodgepodge of cations and anions. That's clearly not the case. In my Moody Blues paper, I provide three very compelling arguments as to why there has to be structure in that core. It's not crystal structure that we can detect by x-rays, but there is structure there, and we just don't know what it is, at least in the public, published literature. So that's really the process, the, the story of calcium sulfonate greases initially. Now, how do we make calcium sulfonate greases? Well, to do that, what Macmillan did and what we still do is we take that overbased calcium sulfonate with this mysterious amorphous calcium carbonate and we subject it to a chemical process whereby we convert the amorphous calcium carbonate into a nano dispersion of calcite. Crystalline calcite, most desirably in the nano range, which by definition means less than 100 nanometers. Each of these little particles, and it will be a range of sizes, it's not just one size, they're surrounded, we believe, spherically in a tight pack with the now neutral calcium alkylbenzene sulfonate or approximately that for the, for the simple calcium sulfonates that Macmillan made. Now, how do you do that? Well, what Macmillan did and what we still do is you have to have converting agents. The conversion is done by converting agents. One of those converting agents is always water. And the other one is a non-aqueous converting agent, which means it's something other than water, obviously. Macmillan usually used carboxylic acids, preferably shorter chain carboxylic acids, most preferably acetic acid. And sometimes he would use something a little bit more aggressive, such as low molecular weight alcohols or glycols or glycol ethers as well. There's a number of examples in these five patents where he does this. A lot of his converting is done under pressure, but not always. Uh, and by this process of heat, in the combination of water and these non-aqueous converting agents, the conversion process changes the mysterious amorphous calcium carbonate, presumably in the core of this reverse micelle structure of the overbased calcium sulfonate, into a reverse micelle structure of nanodispersed calcite particles. Mm. That is what Macmillan did to get his initial calcium sulfonate greases. That's, uh, that is an awesome introduction. Um, maybe just something to pick up on with uh, the nano dispersion of calcite. Um, so I have seen a couple of instances where I've worked with companies that have brought in samples of calcium sulfonate, where there are, you know, visible white particles that are dispersed throughout the thickener. Now, the type of uh, scale that you're talking about, which is less than 100 nanometers, would imply that those white particles should not be visible. So is that, is that an indication that something's gone wrong in the manufacturing process? Well, since I, since I haven't examined those greases, I can't be sure. Here's a couple of possibilities. I'll give you a couple of possibilities that it is, and I'll give you one possibility that it most definitely is not. Uh, it could be that they've added additional mm -hmm. white solid additive material to, to boost the performance and for whatever reason that material wasn't properly dispersed or agglomerated after it was manufactured. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that the conversion process wasn't done under optimal conditions and they didn't get a good nano, entirely good nano dispersion 
and some of that amorphous calcium carbonate grew too fast and wasn't properly dispersed into the desired nano dispersion. Those are two possibilities for what you've seen or what you've heard of. Now let me tell you the one that it's not. And there's some papers that talk about this, but they're wrong. It's not the dreaded V word, vaterite. Okay, if you've read some of the literature, you'll hear people talk about vaterite. Calcium carbonate has three crystalline morphologies, calcite, vaterite, and aragonite. Of those three, only calcite is stable under normal temperatures and atmospheric pressure. Vaterite, let me show you how unstable vaterite is. If you, and you can buy purified vaterite from a chemical company. If you have, they keep it under, under, I think, an inert atmosphere. If you take a clean surface and you put some vaterite crystals on that clean surface, put on a laboratory nitrile glove and press the vaterite, it will instantly convert to calcite. That's how unstable vaterite is. You're not going to see visible particles of vaterite in a grease. It's just, especially when you have significant quantities of the one stable form in the presence of vaterite, the vaterite's not gonna stay there. It just can't under normal conditions. I have had some people I know have done some uh, X-ray diffraction studies, which is the only way you can distinguish between the morphologies of calcium carbonate. You can't do it by FTIR because the, 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 the characterized, characteristic Greek letter nu sub two asymmetrical stretching mode peak around 882, 884 for converted greases and 862 for the amorphous calcium carbonate. And then in between values, vaterite and calcite will absorb all through that range, depending on how you prepare the sample. So you can't use FTIR to know whether you got calcite or vaterite. You've got to use X-ray diffraction. And I have had uh, someone I know and who I trust has said that they found occasionally, very rarely, trace levels of vaterite by X-ray diffraction, but these are trace levels, mm -hmm. nothing that you'd ever be able to see visually. So that would that's my that's my take on what you observed and what you've seen. Thanks, and just to maybe to clarify for the audience as well, the reason why that's a big deal is because the reason we want calcite is it has that sort of lamellar structure, a little bit like molybdenum disulfide or graphite or yes. something like that, right? Which gives you that the properties that you want in a grease. Maybe the difference between a, a calcite and an aragonite or, or vaterite is almost like the difference between um, a cubic and hexagonal boron nitride too, right? Where there's, there's one that you really want well, to and one that you don't. Exactly. In fact, vaterite has needle-shaped crystals. Yeah. Awesome. Um, one thing that really struck me as uh, I was kind of reading through some of the literature for this was that, you know, the development of manufacturing processes for calcium sulfonate, um, let's say the development it hasn't finished and there's um frankly there's it seems like a reasonably complex process uh, in order to develop a calcium sulfonate that might point to some of the challenges maybe with manufacturing because one of the things that it sort of strikes me is that in the current environment there's not that many manufacturers of calcium sulfonate it's not as widely available as something like a lithium complex for example are there any specific reasons why we tend to shy away from, or why manufacturers shy away from it? Um, you know, say, for example, with polyurea creases, I think it's it's reasonably obvious people don't want to deal with the toxicity aspect. Um, that doesn't seem to be present for calcium sulfonates, but is there anything else? Is it just yes. the complexity? Uh, it's the complexity. To explain that, I need to take the development of calcium sulfonates one step further. The original um, uh, Richard McMillan calcium sulfonate greases are now referred to as either as calcium sulfonate gels, or as I like to refer to them, simple calcium sulfonate greases. They're called gels because visually when they form, they look like a gel and they actually are. Um, but uh, in 1985, there was a milestone development. Um, some WITCO scientists, uh, Ron Muir and William Blockus, uh, developed and had patented what they referred to as a calcium sulfonate complex grease. Mm -hmm. What they did was they basically did what Ron, what uh, McMillan did. They developed simple calcium sulfonate grease, 
developed it. So now you've got a simple calcium sulfonate grease stirring in your reaction vessel. Then they added a little more calcium hydroxide powdered, mixing it into the grease structure. And then they added calcium 12 hydroxy stearate, a little bit of calcium acetate sometimes, and um, boric acid. Reacted that, then finished it off. And what, they, what that did was that provided supplementary thickening, drove the total amount of calcium, uh, calcium overbase sulfonate in the grease down from well over 50% down to about 40 to 42%. What this did was it helped to mitigate the one real problem with simple calcium sulfonate greases that Macmillan had developed. And that was low temperature pumpability. The Macmillan simple calcium sulfonate grease had tremendous rust inhibiting properties. Look at it this way, about 2% of that overbase sulfonate will give you pretty good rust inhibiting properties. These original Richard Macmillan greases had more than 50% of it. So they had tremendous ferrous corrosion, rust inhibiting properties. They were great for undercoating. They were great for post-tensioning cables where you need to have rust protection that will last for decades. You know, great, but they had really bad low temperature pumpability because of the high overbase sulfonate content of the greases. With the calcium sulfonate complex greases developed and, and patented in 1985, things got better. Then in 1994, this, the same people developed additional methods to reduce the sulfonate level down to even lower, 40, 24% and even lower if they reacted it under pressure by taking some of that 12 hydroxy stearic acid and adding it pre conversion and then converting. By doing that, they were able to improve the converting process and also, I, I believe, further incorporate the supplementary thickener into the intimate structure so as to drive the overall thickener efficiency up and to drive the overbase calcium sulfonate required down for a number two grease. And this improved the pumpability even more. Now, to get to your point, the complexity. When you do the conversion process, there are a number of things that are happening. When you make a lithium soap or a lithium complex grease, it's simple acid-based chemistry. The reaction is straightforward. There are no side reactions. The reactions go to completion. It's a clean reaction and you basically are gonna get one thing. When you make overbase calcium sulfonate greases, we still do not know, as far as the published literature goes, the exact mechanism of this mysterious conversion process, whereby the amorphous calcium carbonate is converted to a nanodispersion of calcite. And when you add additional carboxylic acids initially, and maybe some other things, some of the things that I've done, it just makes the conversion process that more complicated. And if you don't do it right, you can have problems. I'll give you one example, which everybody knows, so I'm not giving away the store. When you heat up the grease to convert, you don't want to go above 190 Fahrenheit or what that be, what, 82, 88 degrees Celsius? I used to be able to do math in my head before calculators. But, uh, but at any rate, if you overheat, if you go too much higher than the normal conversion temperature, certainly if you start getting up around the boiling point of water, even getting close to it, then you can completely mess up the conversion process and get something that you can't fix. What you'll end up at that point is basically you're going to, instead of getting that nice sharp peak at around 882 or 884, indicating a nice tight nano dispersion of reverse micelle calcite, instead, you're going to get larger particles of calcite up into the micron range even. And lower surface area, bigger particles, lower surface area, lower thickening. So then you end up with a bad thickener yield. And you can also end up with poor shear stability. So it is a system that you need to control. Mm -hmm. And the conversion process can take time. It's not like you take the batch, you heat it from ambient temperature up to 
190 Fahrenheit, 82 or so Celsius. And then boom, you got a grease. You have to hold it there for a little while and you have to control the temperature. If the temperature, if you get an, an escapade, uh, an excursion to help into the well above the boiling point of water, you're pretty much toast at that point, more than likely. And if you mess it up, well, usually you can't fix it. And nobody wants to be making a 20, 40, 60,000 pound batch of grease and have the equipment go wrong. And all of a sudden you have something you can't salvage. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I particularly like the fact that when we were talking about, you know, the way that some of the uh, structures are formed, that we don't entirely know how some of that happens. That, that's like my favorite answer when we when we have these discussions, when people say, well, you don't really know, because it implies that there's a lot of future development ahead of us and, and a lot of research and potentially a lot of improvement as well, right, um, in, in yep. performance. So that's, that is uh, is really, really exciting. Um, and uh, in in um, the March in the March April issue of the Spokesman, I presented uh, a, a, a paper that I presented a year earlier at the annual NLGI meeting. I discussed three different process techniques that I've developed, and, and ultimately they resulted in patents, in which I can dramatically increase the yield of calcium sulfonate complex creases when they are made under open conditions, non-pressurized conditions. And I did this by looking at hence as to the mechanism of the overbased calcium sulfonate conversion process. Now you have to read that paper very carefully, but looking at it apples to apples, one of the things that I did clearly show, even though I was using laboratory methods, which don't always translate to full scale production, apples to apples, it does make sense. And that's simply this. The conversion process by which you convert the, the mysterious overbait of amorphous calcium carbonate to a nanometer version of calcite is at least the process of the reaction of water and the reaction that results from the reaction of water with the primary non-aqueous converting agent, which for open production, is usually going to be some kind of an alcohol or a dialcohol glycol or a glycol ether type of material. The water apparently is primarily responsible for actually making the change from the amorphous calcium carbonate structure to calcite. I'm not saying that it's the only thing that does that, but that seems to be its primary role. And the non-aqueous converting agent or agents appear to be very much involved in controlling the size of the calcite that's formed and facilitating the assembly of that efficient reverse micelle structure around the very small calcite particles as they form so that you get that small size distribution of the reverse micelle calcite structure so that you get a good thickener yield. Now it's more complicated than that but I believe based on the work that I've done and which was reported in that paper, I believe that the conversion process is at least somewhat approximated by what I've just described. Mm. Yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. Uh, maybe to change tack a little bit to once you've got your thickener, um, you know, the other components that go into the grease as well. My understanding is obviously different thickeners work well with different types of base oils. Um, is there a, particular base oil set that, that uh, calcium sulfonates tend to work best with? Well, I've made them in paraffinic oils. I've made them in PAO. And so has ever, a lot of other people. I've made them in naphthenic oils. Um, they can certainly be made in those oils. Based on my experience, of course, any chemical reaction, just go back to basic organic chemistry. The solvent can be important. And the base oil is the solvent that your chemistry is taking place in. So yes, the base oil matters. And I verified that in my work. You can make overbase calcium sulfonate greases and all the base oils I just mentioned, but they don't work exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. um, there, there, there will be some adjustments in some of the things that you do but they can be made. And in fact, 
some of the first calcium sulfonate greases, if you go back to Richard McMillan's work and others, um, they were actually, a lot of them were made in naphthenic oils or blends of naphthenic oils and bright stock. Uh, so um, yes, you can make them. Now, some of the more interesting synthetic base oils, um, I'm not really in a position to talk about that right now, but obviously we have a number of very interesting base oils that have in the past 20 years um, had their day in the sun, mm -hmm. so to speak, uh, alkylated naphthalenes. And certainly I think people that know me well know that I've been for a long time fascinated with estylide chemistry. Yep. Um, a lot of potential there, I think, for a lot of reasons. Uh, but uh, at this point, I think I've, I've probably said all I want to say about the effect of, of the base oil, other than what I repeated, it's the solvent. Yeah. So by definition, the solvent is always going to have a bearing on complicated organic chemistry reactions, especially when you have a whole suite of reactions that are trying to maintain a certain balance. If the solvency can affect the kinetics of the reaction, and it can, and if it affects the kinetics of certain reactions different than other reactions, and you have multiple reactions taking place at the same time, you change the solvent, guess what? You can change the balance of the rates of the reaction and that can affect the outcome. Really interesting. And and I guess that sort of lends itself to a discussion of the additives as well. Now, my understanding of calcium sulfonate greases and the way that they're always sold is that, you know, the fantastic thing about the thickener is that it can do so much of the work for you. So it has some inherent, you've already talked about the corrosion resistance properties or, you know, rust prevention. Um, it, it functions itself a little bit in that sort of EP domain as well. Um, so presumably you need less or fewer additives, um, but are you able to comment on what are your sort of typical additive families that you would use? Sure. Well, you're right. Um, you make an overbase calcium sulfonate grease correctly. I really don't think you need to put in another rust inhibitor. Mm. And it is going to have very good extreme pressure and anti-wear properties. Uh, so in some cases, you may want to augment that. Um, there are people that put black solids into overbase calcium sulfonate greases, um, calcium sulfonate complex greases, molybdenum disulfide, mm -hmm. graphite. Um, do you really need them? I would argue in most applications, probably not. But there is this customer perception. You know, years ago, when I first got started, actually, I worked in cutting oils before greases. And in the petroleum-based cutting oils, you'll find machine shops that have, and this was back in the early 1980s, and it still exists now. You'll have people that believe that if the cutting oil isn't black and opaque, it's not going to be heavy duty. Mm -hmm. Others, on the other hand, want cutting oils that are transparent so they can see in the cutting zone to make sure that the chip is being moved away correctly and to get an examination of the surface finish as it's being formed. And you'll find people in both camps. So companies that make cutting oils for a lot of people, they'll have black ones and they'll have amber ones that both have sulfur materials in them, but they're different sulfur materials and other additives as well. Well, the same thing's true with greases. Some users are convinced that you need to have molybdenum disulfide and maybe graphite. In fact, one very prominent OEM specification for many decades has required 5% molybdenum disulfide in its grease. Mm -hmm. uh, is it absolutely necessary for the grease to work in that particular OEM's equipment? Absolutely not. I, I guarantee you I could formulate a grease that would work perfectly well in those, all those OEM applications without the molybdenum But it's believed to be necessary. And frankly, a lot of marketers, they just like water and electricity, they take the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. And lots of times it's much easier to just give the customer what they want. And as long as you add those solids and it doesn't really mess something up in the process, sometimes that's the best route to take. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Uh, having spent a little bit of time in the field and, you know, try to sell solutions to customers, yeah, often it is you know, the perception that you... Yep. Now, you're going to need antioxidants. The calcium sulfonate thickener isn't going to be an oxidation inhibitor by itself. So you're going to want to put in a good antioxidation 
uh, package because these greases are typically used in high temperatures. That's one of the reasons, that's one of the ways they're marketed. So clearly you need to take care of the oxidation stability mm -hmm. and there's plenty of additives that can, that can take care of that. But the ways to do that are, um, are, are many. If you put in, um, if you do decide to supplement the EP anti wear or the oxidation stability with a sulfur containing material, depending on what you choose, you might need to put a copper passivator in to clean up the D4048 copper strip test at uh, 24 hours, 100 Celsius. Depending on sulfur materials that you put, additives that you put into your oil, that may go after the copper a little bit. So you may need to put in a copper passivator. Um, so, you know, that, that's a possibility as well. Of course, um, you may want to modify the water resistance and there are polymer additives out there to do that. Uh, if you want water washout capability, but you're not particularly concerned about water spray off or static water uh, stability tests, well, you know, that will dictate certain kinds of polymers and the appropriate tree grades. And if you want water spray off, that will determine perhaps other polymeric additives to do that. And then if you're going to be wanting really good low temperature properties, like any other grease, depending on the demands for low temperature properties, that may dictate the base oils that you use. And it, you may have a compromise if you're putting in polymers, there may be a compromise that you need to balance between the water resistance and the low temperature mobility properties of the grease. And that may also dictate a balance of base oils as well. Mm. That's really interesting. Um, I know that you've done some work as well when we're talking about supplementing performance. Um, some of the work that you've done is around kind of like the synergies of some relatively low cost additives that can go into grease thickeners. Um, are you able to you know, briefly talk about some of that work? Yes. Actually, that goes back to my wild and crazy days <laughs> in, when I was actually a, a young chemist back when I worked for Amico Oil Company, back when there was an Amico Oil Company, um, I really cut my teeth in grease with polyurea. Mm. And uh, uh, once you've had gotten polyurea in your blood, you never really get rid of it. Uh, Amico was one of the two main producers of polyurea grease back in the early, mid, late 1980s in the United States. And uh, I developed a number of solid additive combinations to help with polyurea grease. They also work well in calcium sulfonate grease as well. One in particular um, was the combination anhydrous calcium sulfate and calcium powdered calcium carbonate. Both of these are powdered solids that are have a nominal average particle size of around two to three microns. Um, anhydrous calcium sulfate uh, is basically the dehydrated form of gypsum. Hmm. Gypsum is the calcium sulfate dihydrate, and that's commonly used in drywall, hmm. used for home, home you know, uh, production. Looking around my room, I see calcium sulfate in its hydrated form everywhere because it's in the drywall in, in the room I'm in. Uh, what I found in this initial work was I was looking at the literature and I had a sneaking suspicion there was a diamond in the rough that we needed to define. So I had, I had a polyurea base grease that I had made in a laboratory 40 pound double action mixing kettle. We made polyurea base grease. And then I made small little, what I refer to as beaker batches where uh, I weighed a polyurea base grease into the beaker and then I added various combinations of various solid additives, mixed it with a spatula, added more base oil to, to bring it to a, a, a typical constant thickener level. And then I put them in a convection oven, took them out occasionally, heated it till they were at the same temperature. And then I gave it three passes through a three roll mill and made this big series of polyurea greases with these lots of different combinations of additives. Well, I had a technician who he was really a great technician. Everybody needs to have a technician like this. He loved to run four ball EP tests, well load and calculating lower index. And you could give him 
12 greases to do every day for a week. He never got bored doing it. He loved it. Well, he was doing this. He finally knocked on my door and he said, hey, Andy, blend number seven didn't weld. And I said, what do you mean it didn't weld? He said, I mean, it didn't weld. I took it up to 800 and it didn't weld. And I said, how many times did you do it? About four or five. He said, not only that, when I took it out and cleaned the balls after about 10 seconds, the balls were only lukewarm to the touch. Oh, that's interesting. Bottom line is we've discovered a huge synergism between calcium carbonate and anhydrous calcium sulfonate in polyurea grease. Uh, that resulted in a patent. And um, if you uh, pull that patent up, you can see some charts that show, uh, and there's a lot of data in that patent, but the charts basically just show combinations of various combinations where the total solid level is 10%, ranging from 0% calcium carbonate to 100% calcium carbonate, and the remaining being calcium sulfate, sulfate anhydrous, all the way from 0.10 to 10.0 and everything in between. And you'll see in these charts, both the well load and the load wear index spikes around the 50-50 blend with the total solids always being 10%. There's a name for that. It's synergism, real synergism. In our industry, some people really abuse the synergism word. What they really mean, it's just, it just they work kind of well together. But to be a true synergism, you need to have something like is shown on these uh, charts. And this synergism doesn't apply just when the total solids is 10%. I've got a lot more data in that patent and this, you can have a total of 5% or 6% or whatever, this synergism is real. And as I also mentioned, it also has the unusual ability that it tremendously reduces the frictional heat that's generated under high loads, much more so than the traditional oil-soluble sulfur-phosphorus additive systems that were traditionally used for commodity EP anti-wear greases back then. And, and I think to a certain extent are still used today. And that patent provides more information on that as well. The interesting thing about this is twofold. First of all, both of those solids are cheaper than base oil. They're cheaper than a group one paraffinic base oil. They're cheaper than a naphthenic oil, which of course is group five. They're obviously a lot cheaper than PAO or any other synthetic. The other thing is these solids, when properly dispersed into the thickener system, provide a little supplementary thickening themselves, which drives the overall required thickener down. The result of this is you put these additives in your grease, in the, your polyurea grease, and the formulation cost goes down, not up. That's something that won't be true if you use molybdenum disulfide or graphite in your grease or pretty much any other oil-soluble EP anti-wear additive system. Yeah. Are these solids good for any application? No, there are some applications I wouldn't use them in, but they're useful in an awful lot of applications. And I've used this solid not only in polyurea, it works well in a number of other thickener systems as well. That's, that's, that's really fascinating. Um, wow, okay. Uh, so... As we as we sort of start to wrap up these these interviews, I always like to um, get a little window into the future. Now, with calcium sulfonates, it seems like well, the the feeling I get from the industry is that the future is bright, in the sense that there's a, a whole bunch of different converging factors. We've already talked a little bit about the cost increases of lithium, right, pushing people towards alternates, or at least you know. Uh, giving alternates the sort of consideration that they might not have gotten in the past. At the same time, what you've kind of outlined today is um, a lot of potential development in calcium sulfonate. So there's huge areas where we don't have 100% understanding of the mechanisms. And that implies, again, that we can do a lot of research and get improvement in the technology, manufacturing processes, performance of the end product, and all that kind of stuff. So that means that the future looks bright, but is there anything in particular that excites you that you see on the horizon as being something uh, which you're looking forward to? 
Well, a number of things, actually. Um, I am a big believer in the importance of fundamental research. Um, my very first job when I got out of graduate school um, was as an exploratory research chemist. That was my title. And my first boss and my mentor had a philosophy of research, which he ingrained into me and I've used it ever since. I credit it as being responsible for any success I've had in this business for almost 46 years. And the way he talked about it was, Fundamental research gives you this knowledge bank and you need to know that knowledge bank. And then from that knowledge bank, you can discover things. But at some point that knowledge bank starts to get exhausted and you need another deposit in the knowledge bank. That's done by fundamental research. There's a lot of things, as I mentioned, we don't understand about the conversion process. Now, it may be that some of the companies that develop these greases or that develop the overweight sulfonase have, have figured everything out and are holding it proprietary. But I'm going to tell you, I don't think that's true. And here's the reason why. If a company that makes overbased calcium sulfonate greases or makes the highly overbased calcium sulfonates knew the exact mechanism, and by that I mean every bond breaking, every bond formation, including hydrogen bonding, London forces, everything and the right order and the mechanism of everything for how you make the overbase sulfonates and how they convert. If they really knew that, we would have by now had revolutionary, not evolutionary, revolutionary improvements in not only the overbase calcium sulfonates, but in the overbase calcium sulfonate greases. There have been evolutionary changes and evolutionary improvements and evolutionary advances in new technology. I have been responsible for some of those in the past 10 to 12 years, and so have some other people. But there haven't been any revolutionary changes, something that just basically makes everything else totally obsolete. I believe that if there was this complete understanding of the overbase calcium sulfonate mechanism of formation and the overbase calcium sulfonate mechanism of conversion, then somebody that's a really ingenious, really good chemist would take that, all that mechanistic information and they would just have a field day with it. And the fact that that hasn't happened yet, I think strongly argues that we need that mechanistic understanding. Um, I, I think that in that, paper I mentioned earlier, I pointed the direction of some of the things that I think in very general terms are happening. But there's nothing specific that I've talked about there, only directional. But there's a lot more work that can be done. With regard to the potential for calcium sulfonate greases in the future, I think the, the field is wide open. There are some advantages Made, some that I have made that haven't yet been capitalized on that I think open the door to calcium sulfonate greases becoming as good as polyurea greases in things like high-speed, high-temperature electric motor bearings, uh, CD joint greases, um, um, places where polyurea have enjoyed the really gold standard status. Uh, nothing has really dethroned polyurea in a complete systematic way in these applications. But I think some of the newer advances and possibly advances in the future in calcium sulfonate have the chance to do just that. Um, and as you pointed out, polyurea is great. I love polyurea, but there is this business of the diisocyanates. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not nice to work with. And, you know, back when I was in graduate school in the late 70s, and some of the viewers listening to this will remember Bhopal, India, a tragedy, an isocyanate manufacturing facility sprung a leak, and a significant number of people lost their lives. It was a tragedy that underscores the seriousness of these diisocyanates. And 
you know, they really need to be taken care, taken seriously. Uh, so I do think that calcium sulfonate, new technologies on the horizon might provide an opportunity to displace polyurea in some of those applications. Well, uh, that's one possibility. Uh, you know, there may be others. Well, that, I mean, that would be, you know, in some ways ideal because when we're talking kind of of the moment, we of course lost um, a lot of manufacturing capability in polyurea greases relatively recently, right? With the uh, with the chemtool facility. Um, well, exactly. Yeah, and with with people. I think shying away from the risk, understandably, of manufacturing polyurea greases. It may not be that in the short term we have our supplemental supply. And so if we can come in with an alternative technology that can, you know, approximate uh, the performance or even do better, then and then that would be awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, you're you're absolutely right. I mean, look at it this way. When that tragic chem tool plant fire occurred. Within one day, well more than 50% of all North American polyurea production was eliminated. Yeah. And it hasn't been recovered yet. Yeah. Um, well, Mr. Wainick, um, thank you so much for this very, very illuminating uh, episode. Um, you know, I, I think the audience will really appreciate uh, a lot of the material that pre you presented. I, I really like the way that you, you tell the story of the development of calcium sulfonate because it really puts into perspective all the hard work and research that has gone into developing some of these technologies. Sometimes they they, they almost seem faceless, right? But uh, now there's, there's real people behind it and there's real people that continue to develop these greases as well. I, I'm really excited. And, you know, anytime I've ever used them, the, you know, the, the feedback has been almost unanimously good when it comes to calcium sulfonate. So, um, that's something that is really exciting. Um, well, very good. And you know, I, I would like to, at this point, I'd like to do what I refer to as a, a shameless plug. Yeah. The, the, story, the storytelling is something I'm passionate about because I'm passionate about the history of the development of science in general, and specifically in the sciences areas that I've worked in, fuel additive chemistry, lubricants, especially lubricating greases. And this, here's my shameless plug, is our seventh edition of the NLGI Grease Guide. I was responsible for the new chapter one, but there's a lot of other reasons. Uh, I, a lot of my friends and colleagues I've known for decades wrote other chapters in this book, and it really does do a very good job of telling the story of lubricating greases and providing information. You know, if, if lubricating grease is your sand lot, if it's your wheelhouse, if it's your space, and you don't have that book, you really need to get it. I know you told me before we filmed, you've got your copy now, and I know you're going to be reading it, and I'm sure you'll get a lot out of it in the future. Yeah. Uh, there's so much to be gleaned from that book. Yeah. No, definitely. Absolutely. I'd, I'd encourage people to, to definitely pick up a copy, and it's just one of those things, right? We, in the industry, for some reason, we put so much emphasis on uh, the lubricating oils. Um, and lubricating greases don't seem to get as much attention, even though they, you know, you could argue that they're just as widely used, and in some in some industries, even even more widely used. So, yep. um, Andy, you know, really, really appreciate you coming on here and uh, giving us some really in depth knowledge um, about calcium sulfonates. And uh, you know, I'm definitely going to get you back for a round two so we can talk about some other topics. Very good. And as you like to say, I'll paraphrase it just a little bit: lubricating greases, you need to treat it as an asset. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you very much. All right, great.